The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. Money GPS is an Australian fintech that has created leading digital advice technology to meet the unserved advice needs of the 90% of working Australians who cannot afford traditional advice. Users take a fully client-led digital journey with access to hybrid human advisor support across superannuation, investment, retirement and insurance topics. Money GPS offers a turnkey solution to financial advisors, helping to future-proof their business by engaging non-advised clients, enhancing referral relationships and achieving scale through a technology and personal advice solution. Hello, welcome back to the podcast. I have the pleasure of speaking with Andrew Inwood today from, from Core Data. Andrew, thank you for, for joining us. We're going to talk about uh, the, the future of financial advice. You're doing a bit of work in that space, but thanks for joining me first off. And then uh, let's talk a bit about what, what's Core Data. I, mean, I get these emails to say, can you fill in this particular survey? And I'm sure others do. What's Core Data? What's behind Core Data? And then we'll get into the topic of discussion for the day. So Core Data is a financial services research business principally, and we're a global financial services research business. That means we operate in the US and in the UK and in mainland Europe. And I kind of call that old Europe, you know, Germany, France, Italy, um, and those economies, because there's a whole bunch of new economies in Europe, and we're not doing much work in those spaces. What we're really interested in is the way in which – for want of a better phrase, the kind of consolidation of manufacturing arm of financial services bumps up against the humans in financial services. And if you think about the way that financial services work, is that there is a need for the surplus value, which is stored as savings, of the of mass effort and high net worth individuals around the world to be managed efficiently to provide better outcomes. And that's really the role of advice because necessarily, I think, through the evolution of the financial markets, that's become quite complex. So navigating that requires real skill and it requires real discipline and it requires kind of permanent application to that system. So I think of this in kind of four channels, if if you think about it. And so what happens is in Australia, we have 11 million working adults and about 7 million of those working adults are, seven, are mass affluent and better. And they have um, a direct savings capability, which is picked up through the superannuation guarantee, and then a discretionary savings ability, which is this kind of unused excess labor, if you want to think about the Marxist way that that um, works. But then if that's not put to work, then it's it's lost or it's sleepy and it doesn't do as much as it could. But putting that to work efficiently requires discipline, which very few humans possess, and then it requires the skill and then this the role of the advisor to direct that like a, a sheep at a, a sheep race to into what products and what services and what outcomes and then manage that to a, a, a defined series of targets. Now each of those pillars uh, we try really hard to understand. We want to understand how the consumers are behaving. We want to understand how the channels of advice are behaving. We want to understand the, how the platforms are behaving. We want to understand how the software is behaving. We want to understand how the investment gatekeepers are behaving, how the fund managers are behaving, and the custodians are behaving. And that, in some ways, that's just straightforward gap analysis. But this world is complex and tricky because you have to understand the system. It's as complex as the human body. So you can't just bump into it and understand it. So that's that's what core data brings the kind of focus for us is um, it, it, it in the way that I've summed it up inside the organization is evidence-led, purpose-driven conversations. Our, our purpose is to help um, uh, consumers globally do better out of the financial services system and so they can understand those systems better. And, our, and, and it's to be the growth partners for our customers because – our customers are the fund managers, the banks, the distribute the distribution businesses, the advice businesses, the consumption businesses. And growth means it's kind of a superpower word. It means two things. It can be growth and satisfaction, it can be growth in customer numbers, but helping them grow because we think that's important. 
What makes us kind of a little bit unique is that we um, we're really pro advice. That all the research that we've done for the past twenty years shows us very clearly the effect that advice has on on people's behaviours and outcomes. So we come to this with a bit of a maybe a lens of advice being a good thing rather than sort of being a critic of advice, which so many in the space are. Um, it doesn't mean advice is perfect. Advice done badly has a pretty shocking effect on families and economies, but in the main, it's done well. Uh, and in the main, it has really good outcomes for people. There is no data to suggest that advisors are more or less dishonest than any other cohort. There's no, there's no data to suggest that there's more or less deceit in the advice um, network than any other cohort. But of course, it's attracted a lot of tension, attention. And one of the things that I'll be talking about in my regular Sunday infographics pretty soon is the fact that um, trust in advisors is back to the pre hain uh, levels. As you can imagine, after the Royal Commission, um, it, which happened, the, the trust in financial advisors fell, and it fell to a kind of 2 out of 10, and it's back to a 5.9 out of 10, which puts it almost the same as accountants. So that's risen and risen and risen, and we've tracked it since the Hain inquiry to see how it's risen, and that's pleasing to think about. Still doesn't sound very high, though, does it? Like I, that's the first time I've heard you talk about that number, like 5.9 out of 10. It doesn't seem like like a successful number. Yeah, it's, it's, if you think that accountants are 6 out of 10 and that lawyers are 5.8 out of 10, then it is pretty high. Service organisations and banking organisations tend to be relatively low, James. The high ones are things like paramedics and nurses and yeah. doctors. Um, if you want to see a really bad number, then it's insurance company executives that haven't really moved from two. What, what's interesting about that is um, that superannuation fund providers, which was in the six and a six and a half, have started to fall. Uh, and oh, really? we've been we have been drilling into that this week, and it turns out that as people increase their contact with their superannuation provider, their explicit trust um, has started to fall because they're bumping up against them and and discovering that maybe the authenticity that they've always talked about isn't exactly true as service isn't what they want it to be. Uh, and the reverse is true of advisors. As they interact with advisors, they find that service is really good and that pushes numbers up. So that's um, that is one finding, of the things I've been working on this week. And you're finding super funds have, because you, you would have expected the reverse to be true for the super funds. So it, 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 have they, it, 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 as a general idea, been trying to be more proactive in contacting their, their, their clients in some, some way, shape, or form? Habit. I mean, the yeah. reality is that the super funds may never admit this, although some are pretty candid about it. They generally rely on inertia to drive um, their, their numbers, but as people start to focus into retirement, and you can imagine that we've got about we have a, a the number of people that we have in retirement is probably going to double in the next decade, and understanding that that means that the frequency of people contacting superannuation funds is rising really quickly, yes. um, and that they're, they're not really designed for that. Um, the small industry funds do incredibly well because they um, are, are designed for that. And some of the retail funds do incredibly well because they're designed for that. And people would say that's because those phone systems and channels are designed to sell things. But many of the funds, and I'm not going to get into naming them because every time I do it, I get in a lot of trouble, really, really struggle with the um, ability to actually service their members. They're not designed to do it at all, and they haven't really built those systems. And they will say, well, we haven't been able to recruit since post-COVID. We've, you know, we've outsourced that, and that's not going particularly well, um, et cetera, et cetera. But the reality is that those funds who have invested in it, and the best, if you want to know the best, is Unisuper, they're getting great scores out of that process. People are very happy with them. Their engagement scores are high. Their satisfaction scores are high. The the member outcome scores are high. So, I mean, they're a, they're a good sized fund, and yet they're dominating the market in those in that kind of customer satisfaction piece. So, yeah. it's absolutely doable. It's just a matter of where the investment is. Do you think this this kind of different type of advisor that's that that that's that's on the cards that. He's spoken about the, the the super funds being able to offer offer advice without having to have the the full licensing type requirements that that others do. Do you, th- do you think that's an opportunity for the super funds to to be a bit more helpful for their members? It transparently is because the, I mean the challenging thing with the super funds, particularly the large ones, is that the advice services which are designed really suit mass affluent and high net worth people. They don't re- they're not really designed for core affluent people. In our research, we refer to them as trustee directed. They may end up with superannuation balances less than um, $100,000 and absolutely sub 
kind of eighty thousand dollars, and they need to be directed by the trustees to what the right thing to do is, because the funds at the moment are struggling a bit to engage those people and how to use that money and 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 apply it to the best possible outcome that they might have. So they need a facility to do that. In a recent event in Canberra, there, which was put on by the Connexus guys, where they had the top fifteen super funds in the room. The Minister Stephen Jones at the end of the day kind of sat amongst them all and said, I think we should all acknowledge that the great retirement is 30% product and 70% advice. Uh, And um, I think you're unbelievably good at the product piece. And he's right. They are unbelievably good at the product piece. But, you know, the challenge is on the advice side. And that needs to scale from the person who you know, has a many that has hasn't been able to, or lucky enough, or hasn't had the longevity in the career enough to actually build up money inside superannuation, and it also needs to apply to the person who has, through luck or good management or of discipline, managed to build up you know millions in superannuation. So they have to run the scheme and find a way to do that, and that needs advice. Can be anything from information and simple services to people picking up the phone and and get, being outbound engaged. The reality is, and whether we want to admit it or not, we're still pretty weak at that as an industry in Australia. Others around the world are better at it. We don't. We still lack the technology. We still lack the focus. There's some migrations going on, but that's not an excuse we can have forever. We've kind of been talking about that for three or four years now. Who, but if who, still does, talking, who does that well? Well, as I was going to say, the small industry funds do it incredibly well. Yeah. The larger retail funds do it very well. And it's emerging that some of the mid-sized and bigger superannuation funds are doing it well, but they're all on the journey in different points. But what, but what about overseas? Like, is there anything we can learn? From Other Germans are very German. good at it. Yeah. So what, what are they? What are they doing that's different to here? They do uh, well. They have a, a lot of uh, state kind of organised pension systems, as well as other systems like Vanguard, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, they do a lot of outbound push marketing. They do uh, what's called target date marketing. Um, so if you have turned fifty-five, they communicate with you and talk about, "Hey, you're fifty-five now, James. You might want to start thinking about this. You might want to might want to start talking about it." They have they've started using video-based communications well. Um, and, but they do personalization very well. The Americans, of course, do that very well. The best one in the world was a group called AmeriFunds, which was part of the U.S. Navy, uh, so U.S. Army, which have a lot of data on people and use that really, really well. So we're not yet at that point where we're communicate with, communicating with people around significant birthdays. We know uh, very clearly that as, that most Australians don't retire by a choice; they retire through. Um, because they have to care for someone or they're out of work or those types of things, yet we don't have significant birthday communications. Um, And we don't have uh, communication which is based on value, et cetera, et cetera. The English are starting to do that value-based communication very well, looking at balances and communicating with people about what their options are. And that, I mean, that scales well for the very top, but of course that has to scale down through the system. And the rest is... Look, I'll, I'll be candid. There are some super funds that still don't know when people have stopped you know, when they have retired, the only thing they notice is that they've stopped paying in, yet they don't outbound contact them. Yes. Um, and then the other part of that, and I don't want to go too much into this because I'm currently doing some research on this for um, for someone who obviously I won't talk about, but it's yeah. a, that we're still struggling with the idea that retirement isn't retirement anymore, that people are having punctuated retirements. If you stop paying in, declare that you're retired, then go back to paying in, that that challenge is pretty pretty challenging. Yeah, so there's, there's a bit of work to do there. I guess from a financial advice perspective, though, like there's, you know, we can we can build that into our CRMs pretty pretty easily to be triggered that someone's turned fifty five or they've turned sixty or sixty five, and then be proactive on the on the advice front from a uh, at an ordinary financial advice type relationship though. Yeah, I mean, there's a real challenge with this, James, and I think you're probably aware to the, uh, aware of this. And there's a couple of big kind of macroeconomic drivers in this, which are, are kind of worth thinking about. Well, one is that the what we call, of course, out of the red zone of retirement, which we used to run between 55 and 65, because we thought that's when people started thinking about it, and that's when they probably had most likely retired by. So that became really important. So you got the people who are thinking about retirement, the people had recently retired, which is people when they're making big decisions. It started to drift down, and, mm-hmm. and we were drilling into that. It's now we think down to forty-five that people are starting to think about it. And the challenge with that is, is the recent work that we've just done um, for the um, best possible retirement research is that uh, is is that there's a lot of people in Australia now who don't have a house at forty-five. 
So their biggest asset is their superannuation, and they're starting to think about what does that really mean. Now, we know through our research, and you may be aware of some of this, is that one of the biggest drivers of happiness and satisfaction in retirement is owning your own house. So, and that means that you have a lot of flexibility and and a lot of power in in that space. But as soon as that's not going to happen, or is unlikely to happen, or maybe not the house of your choice, then retirement really starts to change. Because, I mean, the fear of running out. I mean, you can live on beans and toast if you're living in your own house, but if you're paying rent still, then that's a challenge. It is, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I suppose then you got the whole system. And I have this conversation all the time with people to say. Now, the, the, the two big things you need to be focusing on, that people trying to make it really complicated, is that you need to own your own home outright and then have enough money in other assets to support your income needs. So let's keep it simple there and then we and then we build and then we build on it. But then you've got the whole Australian age pension system is 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 far more geared towards you owning your own home than not owning your own home. So you you can have a five million dollar house and, and get collect the age pension, but if you've got you know well, you're, around, you, you're in a, you're in trouble. That's so true, James. So it, in the street that I live in, Mossman, I mean, there's not one house, and I'm embarrassed to say how much they're worth. But, but you know, my, you know, I've worked really hard since I was sort of 17. So, and I've been a bit lucky with real estate investment. But there's a couple in it who inherited the house from their from their doctor, mother, and father, and were school teachers their entire life. So they're fully on the age pension, hmm. and are living in a, a what I guess is an eight million dollar house. Yeah, and so. Look, I think those settings are likely to change. The next election in Australia, which will be in the first quarter of next year, will be the last election in which baby boomers hold the hold the the balance of power. And so, as that balance of power starts to shift, the things which are um, are advantaging those people who benefited from asset price inflation will will start to shift as well. So, you know, let's start to think about what that means and and, and how that's happening because that you know that one of the things that the government might want to do is to start to to tax the baby boomers. Now, I mean, I'm a baby boomer, the last of the baby boomers, you know, literally born on the last day of the boom, which is in the middle of 1964. <laughs> but the reality is that we ought to be adjusting those settings because, the, the you know, we are fast diminishing. The, the youngest baby boomer is 60, and the settings shouldn't suit the people who are in runoff. They should suit the people who are in the process of building up their asset, and we ought to think about that pretty hard. What about demographics? Like I, was, I, was, I saw, a, I, was, I was reading something, and there's a book here actually that I saw it in just the other day, this idea that in, in a lot of de- developed countries, and, and I, I don't imagine Australia is terribly much different, we've got this people living longer and so you've got this, you know, the, this swell of people, the baby boomers heading into retirement that are therefore then generally going to be paying less taxes. There's maybe less working people per retired person like, are you seeing any conversation playing out from a super fund level, from a government level, as to how do how do the how do the settings change to to support that environment where you've got less potentially less people working and and more people in retirement to to you know draw in on pensions and so forth. So this is a really interesting phenomenon which is happening, and we're uh, in the middle of challenging that in inside Australia. Our tax base is what you're referring to is shrinking. Yeah. Um, and so that's literally what I was talking about. As the tax base shrinks, they're going to have to find other places to get taxation revenues from. And obviously, it's going to be the rich. Um, uh, that's a place where, and the older rich, so they're going to have to think about how they do that. And I, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Um, but yeah, we're not creating enough net new uh, Australians naturally. So we're trying to import them as fast as possible. <laughs> that importing of things needs to be done very carefully. So, I mean, we if, if we import people who are hardworking, want to have education, want to get involved in the system, are good at paying tax, are good at building communities outside their own and doing those things, then that's going to be happiness. But if we import that incorrectly, then that's going to be sadness. Now, there's some cases for that which you can see kind of bubbling up around the world. You would argue that the current tension that's occurring in the UK is from a partly caused by, you know, a constricted economy and a rising group of haves and have-nots, but not particularly well thought through uh, immigration policy, which resulted in Brexit, really, because the way in which they wanted to do it. There's some clues uh, that we are rushing to catch up post-COVID because prior to COVID and prior to the Albanese government, under the kind of Howard and Morrison governments, we're importing in about 
you know, an Adelaide a year of people, and, and there was a lot of high income visas people coming in who, you know, doing work here and preserving assets and doing those things. And while that's changed, we might have to think hard about what the effects of, of that change. I understand, but I don't know in detail that there's a lot of humanitarian visas being issued for Gaza at the moment. And, you know, I'm relatively speaking, I'm pro that, but that's not a long term solution to high, you know, high end manufacturing and, and those processes. And, and those, those things kind of always cause tension. I think one of the things that you might be aware of is that Germany identified those problems under the Merkel government and, and then started importing people very quickly from um, near what you would call in the old days Asia Minor and particularly Syria. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm pretty friendly with a young German woman who runs all that, and she said the Syrians are great because, um, uh, you know, they're pretty sophisticated, they're well-educated, they're prize education, they're prize work, you don't, they use computers, they're et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But other areas didn't have the same benefits. People were, you know, they wanted to form cliques, they wanted to, you know, and do those types of things. So this is tricky and something I'm not really qualified to comment on, James. I mm. do see the economics and the economics behind it, and that's that's um, really, really challenging. The other economists, and more particularly demographers, have called the, that, you know, Japan is done because they have not been able to manage all those things. Um, sure. And that China may be done because they haven't been able to do those things as well. So there is quite a bit of tension in that system i do remember going to japan about must be seven years ago and meeting a whole bunch of japanese economists and talking about that and then talking to them about how they were going to manage their decline in particular the labor force and how they were going to manage the old people and they were genuinely suggesting that robots were going to do it and when i asked the japanese economists i was talking to how many people they had you know, brought to Japan that year, the answer was 11. Um, uh, it was at the time that um, Japan was hosting the World Cup of Rugby, so it was a suspiciously close number to a rugby team, I thought, at the time. <laughs> but, I mean, that that obviously isn't going to work, but they, they, they have tension with their new neighbours, with the Koreans and, the you know, the Chinese, et cetera, et cetera. How, how's the Australian consumer feeling at the moment? Do you, do you have a sense of, you know, we're, we track we're it COVID every- and up and down and, like, where are we at at the moment? Yeah, so we track this every quarter. So yeah. we have a very clear um, sentiment analysis of what's going on. Uh, and for the first time, James, it's really split. The rich people who have income certainty are feeling very confident yeah. and are waiting for um, the uh, the interest rates to come down so that they can push back harder into the market. Um, but there is an increasing number of people who are absolutely really worried, who don't have employment certainty, who don't have kind of asset certainty, who are really bur- bur- carrying the burden of the asset that, of the cost of in money increases, and they're really worried about what their future, and they're starting to trim their purchasing decisions, et cetera, et cetera. For the you know giggles of it, we track the easily available data because one of the things that we look at is, um, and it's not news for us, but it's this thing called luxury purchase data, which are boats and cars, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the other one is white good replacement data, and both of those are off. Okay. So luxury cars are coming down. They're down by as much as 20% at this stage, and boats are absolutely off. No one's trading boats at well because people are worried about the future. Um, I don't have the latest white good data yet, but my sense is that if I was to ask um, people about it, it would, slide to, it, it would be down. The retailers that are doing well are the ones like JB, JB Hi-Fi who have that kind of smaller discretionary purchase rather than Harvey Norman who are selling you know, lots of big white goods. It's interesting. Yes, I'm, I'm not surprised with your comments about the cars. I, m- m- my Instagram, the the ads that appear in the stories on my Instagram feed, um, there's there's often you know some of the some of the luxury car brands. Oh, you can buy a car at 1.99 percent finance. It's like okay, you 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 must be slowing down the rate at which the the cars that you're selling, if you're offering them at, if you're trying to finance them at two percent and and get people to come and buy them. Well, that's, I mean, that's just getting off the lot and trying to make money out of the servicing part. And that's a kind of old, old way of doing it. For the, I mean, you probably don't know this, but I like old cars. I like a yeah. car that I can work on. You've got your Vespa. I thought it's so funny. You've got your old Vespa. Is it an old Vespa or a new Vespa? Uh, I've got rid of the old Vespa. I sold yeah. that one for good money, which I hasten to add, and bought a pumpkin orange 300cc Vespa, which is pretty easy to work on as well. 
But I like a kind of nineteen between nineteen sixty and nineteen eighties car, either uh, um, Australian uh, or European. I don't particularly like the English ones; they weren't well made at that time. That was the kind of the, the height of the industrial actions at that time. But not nonetheless, I had one of those, and I sold it in the middle of COVID for far more money than I deserved to sell it for, uh, which was um, a kind of interesting moment because. Um, I had to explain that a that it was sold and that it was sold for a lot of money, and 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 see that the person paid me in cash in a sports bag, which was interesting in its own right. <laughs> um, but that car, for example, has has effectively halved in price mm-hmm. now, and I see them to the point where uh, I'll be candid with you, James. I, I repurchased recently. It was it, it, let's say it was. Look, like being candid, it was you know they were advertised commonly at a hundred thousand, and and the guy rang up and said, "I've found one of these, and it's a hundred thousand." I said, "Yeah, call me when it's fifty thousand. And um, about three weeks later, he said, "Well, I can't get you the fifty, but uh, you know, I can get you pretty close." close. Yeah. And, and so we we you know we closed on it, and I thought this is such a big swing in the time of what's going on, and with new cars, I think it's I suspect it's even worse. So you know, yeah. What is the, where to with the future for financial advice? What what's your sense on that? Like you, you know, you it's the really gold kind of and things. Financial advice. There's yeah. this the next fifteen years were probably the best time ever for financial advice. Partly because um, the accidentally the the government has absolutely constrained supply and advice. We're down to fifteen thousand one hundred and seventy seven registered advisors, but practically only about um, eleven thousand odd working full time. And of those 11,000 working full-time, only a quarter of them have really well-declared growth intentions. Yeah. So that's really interesting to me. It means that the rest of the businesses are in technical runoff. Now, there's never been a bigger need for advice as people push into retirement and it's getting more and more complex. We assess using some pretty um, basic algorithms about demand and satisfaction that there's about one point there's about a shortfall of about 1.7 million in terms of Australians who want advice who can't get advice because of the way in which supply has been constrained. Yeah. Now that's going to lead to a couple of things. One is it's going to lead to price inflation, and it's already leading to that. We're seeing prices go up pretty steadily around the marketplace. Um, then it's going to lead to um, advice effectively becoming a luxury good. So it's going to drive up the growth of direct advice, of partial advice, of people working in other spaces, et cetera, et cetera. So for a business like yours, this is going to be a great time as people you know, seek advice early, you know, try and understand what they need to do and, and try and find it. And, and, and we see sort of service prices rise. The advice, I mean, the biggest thing that advisors are worried about is the, co- the inflation and the cost of providing advice. Yeah. And that's, that's pretty real. Um, uh, we've done a lot of modelling for the FAAA on how much it actually really costs to produce advice, and it's gone up quite a bit, which is uh, which is interesting. Not just from the fact that the CSLR is you know a new impost on advisors, <laughs> but the cost of rent, the cost of people, the cost of humans, the cost of all the services. Uh, and while people are pushing harder into the AI space, learning how to do that, getting the licences to do it, that's all that's all increasing the cost as well. So there is is a bit of a struggle in that space at the moment as people try and work out how to get scale. And Do you have a number like it, the, from the work you've done on what, what is the cost to deliver advice? Do you have an idea well, what that looks look, like? The, the research is really the FAAA, so it's theirs to release, sure. and it's and, yep. and we're still in, um, in 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 sort of finagling with the model, but we're pretty pretty close. We'll see. But so yeah. they should they should they'll they'll release it and push it. Um, yep. We've done it in the past. Um, this is about three years ago, and that's our research, and that suggests that it's you know between f- five and six thousand dollars. You can expect it to go have gone up from yeah. from there. Yep. And by the way, it's um, we've done that work in the US, in West. I was going to say West Germany is only Germany now, of course. Germany, Italy, and France, and Australia is expensive. We're yes. re- as we are really expensive in terms of doing advice, and it's. It's mostly imposed by the legislator, which are the costs of doing that. Yeah, and do you see that coming? Do you see that cost coming down at all? Like, is there anything on on your horizon that may that, that may mean that that either stops going up at the rate that it's gone up, or it, or it actually comes down? Yeah, it is. There are businesses which are driving it down and who are getting scale benefits. So some of them, are, it's the processes and systems that they're working on, which are allowing them to scale up and add new customers per advisor and be more efficient at doing that. 
that's a combination of services and processes. Um, some people are using the um, variation in labour costs between outsourcing and Australia to drive that down. Some people are massively simplifying their businesses to allow them to just really only do one thing and allow them to scale to scale up. I caught up with a couple of businesses in Queensland recently who had really simplified what they're doing, and they they are making you know, fantastic money with really satisfied customers because they only do one thing and do it really well yes. and spend their time concentrating on servicing the client, not man- managing the money. That's a really allowed them to scale. And I mean, talk about a thing, you know, if one of those guys had bought a, you know, a, a very enviable Porsche <laughs> and another one, a, a variable enviable um, Aston Martin, I completely agree with their decision making. That's what I'd buy too. But, uh, you know, the, seeing those effects come through and I think we're going to see that as business specialise. There's a lot of kind of noise in the systems now as businesses merge and model themselves and change and do all those types of things. Um, but that that'll come out. Um, it, it, that'll come out in sort of ten to twelve months, and that and the great repricing is going to be at work as well. Yeah, great, Andrew. I might leave it there with you. Uh, we could talk for a while, but I know you've taken some time out of a conference that you're over in New Zealand at the moment uh, to uh, to chat with me. So thank you for joining us, and maybe we'll get you back. Uh, another another time, not too in the not too distant future, to uh, to share a bit more of your insights with us. Always happy to chat, James. I think the way in which you're leading the conversation of financial advice and making it available to the public is terrific. Uh, and you know, m- long may you continue to get people to think I should stop to an advisor after seeing one of your TikToks or podcasts or any of those things. Thanks, Andrew. Much appreciated. Right. Pleasure.